One of the um, amazing features of our vision is its ability to adapt to a wider range of light intensity, spanning about 10 orders of magnitude. So for example, a piece of white paper under a bright outdoor sunlight with no cloud can be a billion times brighter than in a moonless night. However, the eyes are not sensitive to this whole range all the time. Um, instead, at any given moment, the eyes are only sensitive about three to four orders by restricting the dynamic range of its response to match the uh, current overall or ambient light level. So our visual system is equipped to maintain relative sensitivity to light rather than the absolute sensitivity. So to reach a wider range of light levels, human visual system needs some adapting time to switch between the two modes of operation. Here the scotopic, mesopic, and photopic regions are defined according to whether rods alone, rods and cones, or cones alone operate respectively. The way in which we adjust the light influx is somewhat similar to how camera adjusts the uh, level of exposure. In photography, the level of exposure will determine how light or dark an image will appear when captured by camera. So the amount of light influx to camera can be adjusted by the combination of three settings listed here. So the aperture determines the area of incoming light whereas shutter speed determines the duration of light influx. And finally, ISO uh, determines the sensitivity of the sensor given the amount of light. Similarly, um, the amount of light influx is first controlled by the pupil reflex in the eye by constricting or dilating. So under bright illumination, pupil is constricted um, whereas it is dilated when the light level is very low. So pupil diameter arranges from about two millimeter to eight millimeters. So this is a factor of four, and that means is that the amount of light that can be adjusted by pupil response uh, is about an order and a half of magnitude. So that is because four is diameter here, and then and you have to square this to get the error, right? So 16. So it's about like an order and a half magnitude. And the rest of the adjustment to different light levels is uh, accomplished by the retina itself. Um, in order to see under a broad range of light levels, our visual system has the evolved into two um, systems differently sensitive to the amount of light available. Um, so namely, these two systems are um, scotopic and photopic system. And the, um, it's like having two different ISO settings with a different sensitivity given the amount of light. So um, as you can see from this slide, a um, scotopic system is mediated by rods, whereas photopic system is mediated by cones. And the scotopic system is kind of very slow um, in, in, in responding to the light level. And photopic system, uh, on the other hand, it is very you know, quick in terms of a, a you know, temporal property of the of photopic system is uh, very fast um, as long as there's enough uh, light in the environment. And the scotopic system is um, you know, most sensitive to light whereas photopic, uh, photopic system um, is providing the finest spatial resolution. So um, the scotopic system um, has a very poor spatial resolution in, ex in expense of the maximum sensitivity to light. And the scotopic system is pretty much colorblind, whereas photopic system is uh, responsible for most of our color vision. And as I said, uh, scotopic system has a terrible spatial resolution, about 6 over 60, that whereas the um, you know, photopic system provides um, the finest, most fi uh, the finest spatial resolution, 6 over 6 vision. But um, 
uh, in, in expense of the absolute sensitivity to light. Now, as I said, um, the scotopic system um, has an exquisite sensitivity to light in expense of spatial resolution. So this trade-off can be explained by the mechanism called spatial summation by rods. So spatial summation is a mechanism to generate an action potential in a cell by combining multiple uh, neuronal signals from the neighboring cells. Anatomically, cones will be found exclusively within fovea, whereas rods will be found mostly outside fovea. So sensitivity to light is known to be very high outside the fovea, where, uh, where a large group of rods converge on a single ganglion cell. So um, the figure here is a schematic illustration of a scotopic retinal organization where a large number of rods are connected onto a single ganglion cell. Right? So this is a ganglion cell and these um, you know, bars represent rods and to signal a light detection, right? And this gangrene cell needs 10 photons, so 10 units of light. Okay, so now um, this animation will show you um, the five units of light photons will fall on this gangrene cell. So, right. So this ganglion cell would not know if there was a, a light or not because um, the amount of light is actually sub-threshold, right? You need 10 photons, but only five units of light fall on this ganglion cell. So this ganglion cell uh, would not recognize the light. <clears throat> so it is only when 10 or more, more photons fall on this ganglion cell to signal the light event, right? Now, two spots of light uh, would fall on the right and left side of retina separated by the uh, distance x. Um, distance x and then each spot will contain five units of light photons, which are sub-threshold amount of light detection. So, each spot alone cannot invoke a sensation of light. However, under scotopic condition, the ganglion cell will add them up and across the, uh, across the, across the uh, large distance. So as long as the distance X is within the coverage of this ganglion cell summation, and the amount of light from these two spots will be, uh, will be added up to 10 quanta which now reaches over the threshold amount of light to signal the presence of light. So here, the, uh, the sub-threshold of um, two lights will be added up over this distance to signal a single light detection event, right? Um, but unfortunately, the consequence of this summation is poor spatial resolution. Here now we have two spots of light fall on the right and left side of the retina separated by the same distance x. And this time, uh, each spot will contain 10 units of light photons, which are threshold amount of light detection. So each event of light can invoke uh, the signal, uh, the light detection uh, alone. But when they fall, in different regions of this ganglion cell, they will be just added up together. So these two will be merged together to, to signal the detection of a single light instead of a two light events, right? In, in, so in expense of spatial resolution. So this is the reason why the scotopic system has excellent sensitivity to light, but poor spatial discrimination. On the other hand, the photopic system has very limited summation range compared to the scotopic system. So here are the uh, flipped triangles. Um, so these triangles uh, represent uh, the um, cones um, 
each sensitive to respective colors. So red cones will be sensitive to the red color and the green cone will be sensitive to green color. And there's another um, cone sensitive to blue, but the red and green cones are majority uh, and blue cones are quite, you know, quite rare. So they are not um, shown here. So now let's assume that each ganglion cell requires the same amount of 10 photons to signal the detection of light. Then any ganglion cell cannot detect any of the light with five units of photons like this. That, you know, um, light falls on the middle ganglion cell and, you know, it would know if there was a light or not, right? Ganglion cells in scotopic system, these ganglion cells also need at least a threshold amount of light to signal the detection event. So here we have a spot of light containing 10 photons, which is uh, the adjusted amount of um, photons to um, signal the light detection. So now this ganglion cell signal the uh, single light detection event. And now let's assume that two spots of light with sub-threshold amount of photons, five photons each, fall on the right and the left of the left side of the retina. So unlike the ganglion cell from the scotopic system, there will be no summation to signal light detection because the range of summation is quite limited, right? Well, in fact, they are just uh, separated, so there is no summation and there will be no light detection event. Now, um, now each light contains 10 photons this time and they they will fall on the same spot same part of the retina and now here the system will signal two separate light events instead of us summing them as one so this is the reason behind the fine resolution of photopic system but worse sensitivity to faint light So these two visual systems, photopic system and scotopic system, are known to regulate the range of light intensity by way of adaptation. So light adaptation occurs um, as the level of background illumination is slowly increase, increased. So people studied how these two systems differ in detect, detecting a spot of light embedded in different ambient background. So here is an example um, representation of stimulus used in light adaptation experiment. So in a typical setup, um, the observer will first adapt to a completely dark background. So this is the kind of background luminance, which is not completely dark, but they first need to be adapted to the background luminance um, for more than about like a 30 minutes. So <clears throat> That is the reverse process of light adaptation, which is dark adaptation, which takes more time than the light adaptation. So uh, once they are dark adapted, then the luminance of the center will gradually increase until the observer sees the spot. So which is basically measuring the difference threshold or just noticeable difference, J and D. So once this increment threshold is measured for the given background luminance, then the luminance of the background increases slightly. And now we measure this different threshold again and repeat the same steps over a wide range of background intensity. So here this uh, triangle looking like a letter is um, delta. This is another Greek letter, capital D and I is the intensity, right? So this is the, uh, the increment threshold or difference threshold uh, between the background and uh, the spot. And the IB, the intensity you know, background, is the, the, the uh, background um, illuminance. Now, this is a kind of simple, a simplified result of light adaptation experiment. So on the x-axis, we have the log background luminance, 
and the log increment threshold is on the y-axis. So in the first section of uh, in the first section, the log increment threshold remains constant. And this is the region where the detection is limited by our own internal noise. So briefly, um, this internal noise can be thought of as kind of a spontaneous neural activity, which is random and constant brain activity at rest. So our brain is constantly buzzing um, due to uh, this activity. And this spontaneous activity is collectively dubbed as internal noise. And now from the second section, the log increment threshold starts to increase with the slope of 0.5, so half slope. Um, this is where the fluctuation in light source affects the increment threshold. And this is, uh, so this relationship is known as uh, De Vries uh, Rose Law. In the third section, the log increment threshold linearly increases with the unit slope over the range of about four orders of magnitude. And this is the region where Vapor's Law holds. So the Vapor's Law maintains that the amount of change in stimulus magnitude, intensity, or strength required to detect change from the initial impression is dependent upon the initial strength of the original stimulus or the background, and the ratio between these two quantities are constant. So this shows our perceptual sensitivity is maintained constant relative to the initial level of impression to which we adapted, and that is the essence of the Weber's law. And this was the first law expresses the relationship between an initial stimulus with a certain intensity, magnitude, strength, or quantity, and the minimum amount of change in the same dimension to notice the change in the sensation. So here, the you know, delta, again, um, is the Greek letter, um, is the difference. Um, and so this difference um, and the, uh, the background intensity, the ratio between these two, are con uh, is constant k which is known as a vapor's fraction so what that means is that your increment threshold or just noticeable difference threshold will increase as the background intensity increases or vice versa so you will get more sensitive um, uh, as the background intensity decreases or vice versa so the Faber's law, um, in a nutshell, um, is basically saying that the amount of change in stimulus strength, magnitude, or intensity required to invoke the change in sensation from the initial impression is contingent upon the initial stimulus strength. So the Weber's law is really um, this linear relationship between the increment threshold and background luminance. Sometimes this relationship is called weber fechner law because Fechner also described the same relationship in a slightly different manner independently. So this law can be expressed mathematically as in these two equations, right? Delta I equals K times um, IB or K equals delta I divided by the background intensity. So um, this is just a basically stating that the increment threshold is a linear function of a background luminance with a constant factor known as a Weber's fraction. Now, if we plot the increment threshold delta I as a function of background intensity, then you will see a straight line with a constant slope of K um, and this constant slope can be shown in different way when the ratio uh, between the increment threshold and background intensity is plotted against the background intensity, then you will see this flat line across all the, uh, uh, the background intensity. So that 
um, ratio is basically the K-Vapors fraction across the range of background luminance. Because Weber's law holds over several orders of uh, uh, luminance, it is convenient to use the log form instead of a linear form. So if you take the log on both sides of the previous equation from the original Weber's law, then the K, the constant K, and the background intensity are decomposed uh, as in this equation. So uh, in this log form, if we plot the log increment threshold right on the right, and against the log background luminance, then the graph will, will be still a straight line, but now the slope is 1 instead of a k, and the log k, right, log k, this term, becomes the y-intercept somewhere. So the, the, the figure on the right is basically the replotted re version of the left figure right, after log transformation. So you can see that you know, the data you know, both data just uh, still fall along a straight line. And this Weber's law is one of the uh, very few laws in psychophysics uh, generalized over a wide range of sensation and perception. So this is in vision, but this applies to audition or um, tactile sensation too. Okay, so now we're moving on to the section four where the rods are now saturated and they're not uh, responsive anymore to any luminous difference because they are completely overwhelmed by the uh, brightness of the background. And the section five, um, now the, uh, we're entering into the photopic system and the photopic system now takes over and we see another region where the log increment threshold rises again as a function of log background luminance with a unit slope. So um, what you need to take away from this graph is that section 3 and section 5 are the regions where log increment threshold increases as a function of log background luminance with a unit slope. So these are the regions where Weber's law holds. Here we have um, you know, different uh, Weber's fractions. So um, the K subscript S is the uh, Weber fraction for scotopic system. And the um, K subscript P represents the uh, Weber's fraction in photopic system. So scientists found that Weber's fraction for rods um, is about 0.14, whereas 0.015 for cones. So what that means is this. Um, in case of scotopic system, for example, if the background luminance is 100 unit, then at least a 14 units of increment to the background, which is 114, um, is um, needed to detect the stimulus. If the background luminance increases to 1,000 unit, then the increment must be 140. So this way, our relative sensitivity is kept constant, but our absolute sensitivity decreases as the background luminance increases uh, because our threshold is increased from 14 units to 140 units. So this trade-off between the relative and absolute sensitivity is known as sensitivity regulation. And this um, illustrates an important principle of visual perception that our visual system is more sensitive to the relative difference in luminance, such as contrast, than the absolute levels of luminance. So all we really need is this relative difference, not the absolute difference between the object and background in luminance to be able to recognize that object. So this... Um, definition of the Weber contrast, right, we learned last time, is a direct uh, reflection of the Weber's law, right? So this is the difference in light level divided by the overall light level. Um, 
So your phone these days uh, would probably have this adaptive brightness function where the uh, brightness of display changes according to the background light level, which is detected by the, um, the photosensitive diode uh, installed in your phone. So this feature tries to uh, adaptively adjust the brightness of the display to the optimal level for the user uh, relative to the amount of background light, which is a direct application of Faber's law. However, um, many times I found this function is more annoying than helpful because the response is too slow.